بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Uh, the last verse was أيحسب أن لم يره أحد. Then Allah عز وجل says ألم نجعل له عينين. Have we not made for him two eyes? The, uh, the verse before this was about man not thinking that Allah sees him. Then Allah Azza wa Jal reminds him that he subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who provided him with his seeing senses, the two eyes. Right? The faculty with which you see. You see with your eyes. Who provided you with these eyes? Allah. Did you not think that he sees you, though he is the one who provided you with something with which you can see? Is he then, you think, that he is unable to see you and that you can hide from him? Uh, SubhanAllah, and this uh, logic in, in the two verses, uh, again, Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran uh, uses such logic a lot that because if you're not convinced with something that touches the heart, then you will be addressed with something that you cannot deny, something tangible that you agree to and confirm to or of, right? So the eyes in, them, in themselves are a sign of the ability of Allah Azza wa SubhanAllah, I don't want to go into the details of, of the scientific uh, aspect of the eyes and the number of nerves and the number of veins and number un it's too complex and too detailed so allah Azza wa Jal is remind reminding arrogant people this human being who forgot his origin and who forgot who created him and who forgot who blessed him with this favor eyesight is a favor is a bounty from Allah Azza wa Jal. And Allah Azza wa Jal didn't ask you anything in return except to use it in His pleasure and to refrain from using it in what displeases Him. What displeases him. So the only return expected from this bounty you're blessed with is to properly use it for the purpose it was created for. It was not created for you to misuse it. To look at things that you're prohibited from looking at. Use it in something that is permissible and in reflecting on the signs of Allah Azza wa Jal that lead you to Allah Azza wa Jal and that strengthen your belief and faith in Allah Azza wa Jal. And it's the question here is a form of making the questioned person confirm to the fact. So it's not like, don't you know that we've given you eyes, you're going to say, no, I don't have eyes. This is not an intended answer. The answer is, of course. Yes, I confirm. And this is the intended purpose behind uh, this question. Now, one of the reasons or one of the ways of the Qur'an is that he reminds us, Allah Azza wa reminds us in the Qur'an with things that will become means of accountability on the Day of Judgment. Right? Allah Azza wa is mentioned in the eyes. Right? And Allah Azza wa will hold us accountable. We saw the signs that prove the greatness of Allah Azza wa Jal and the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jal, the Lordship and the divinity of Allah Azza wa Jal. So we will be questioned about that. A blind person will be held accountable in general, but this is something that Allah deprived him from, so he won't be held accountable for. As Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, says in Surah Al-Insan, فَجَعَلْنَاهُ سَمِيعًا بَصِيرًا 
We made him hearing and seeing. So we gave him the two senses with which he can see and he can hear. He can see the signs and he can hear the message. So he has no excuse in rejecting, in denying. وَلِسَانًا وَشَفَتِهِ And a tongue and two lips. With one tongue, we can be destroyed. Can you imagine if we were created with more than one tongue? No, seriously. Allah Azza wa Jal, the scholar said, Allah created man with two lips so that it is the principle of the situation of the mouth is that it's like this. It's closed. The lips guard the tongue from uttering something because the moment you, you open up, recording starts. And as the Prophet ﷺ said to Mu'adh, and this is a, an authentic narration reported by Ahmed, classified as authentic by Al-Albani. It's a long narration, but at the end, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what else do you think of Mu'ad would cause people to be thrown on their faces in the hellfire other than their consequence of their tongues, meaning what they utter. It's destructive. It's a lethal weapon if we don't use it properly. Another uh, reason or justification of mentioning or coupling these two together, the tongue and the lips, as some of the scholars said, is that you can't talk properly and fully without using both. Because there are letters that are purely uttered by or pronounced by or from the lips, like the mean, the ba, the wow, and the fa, right? And there are many letters, subhanAllah. It's, it's interesting enough that the majority of the alphabet is pronounced from the tongue. The majority of the letters is pronounced from the tongue. As an indication that it's, uh, it's seriously destructive if you misuse it. Most of the letters are pronounced from there. And again, this is a hint to mankind. Remain silent as much as you can. As the Prophet ﷺ said, Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmi al-akhiri fal yaqul khayran awli yasmud. Whoever believes in Allah and the hereafter, let him say something good or remain silent. Remain quiet. It's better for you. It's safer for you. That's why it's recorded that some of the Salaf used to uh, talk only when it's necessary to talk. One of the students of Shaykh Ibn Baz alayhi, told me that Shaykh Ibn Baz, if he was not talking to you, he would be uh, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you ask him a question, he will be moving his lips until it's time for him to respond, to give the fatwa or the explanation or sit in a, in a uh, study circle, then he would talk. Other than that, he would just remember Allah Azza wa and utilize this tongue and these two lips for that. Then Allah Azza wa says, وَهَدَيْنَاهُمْ نَجِدَيْنَ And we have shown him, we have guided him uh, the ways, the two ways, uh, rather, not the ways, the two ways. What are these two ways? The predominant opinion, there are different opinions, but the, the predominant opinion regarding this is that it's the way of evil and the, 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 the way uh, of good. Allah Azza wa Jal clarified for us, made it very clear. And some things, Allah Azza wa Jal created man naturally knowing that it's evil and naturally knowing that it's good. Whether you're a believer or a disbeliever, you naturally know that killing is evil. Lying is evil. Cursing people and bad-mouthing them is evil. 
being merciful to the weak is good. Being kind in treatment to others is good. So Allah Azza wa Jal created us with certain things that we know by nature and then guided us through messengers and books to the path of good and distinguished, differentiated between the path in good and the path of evil through other means. So people were guided. The path of Tawheed, the, ta the, the path of Islamic monotheism, and the path of polytheism was made clear. The truth and falsehood were made clear. Everything was made clear. Distinction between them was made clear by Allah Azza wa Jal. So now no one would have an excuse with Allah Azza wa Jal on the day uh, of judgment. Now, after Allah Azza wa Jal clarifies what's good and what's evil. Allah leaves the decision, leaves the choice up to the human being. So when it becomes or when the truth becomes very clear, it's natural or the natural reaction expected is that one would follow it without reluctance, would hasten into it. Correct? That's the expected natural reaction or response. Once you find out where is what is good for you. So that's why Allah Azza wa Jal follows the saying, فَلَا قُتَحَمَ الْعَقَبَةِ But he has not broken through the difficult pass. This means, why didn't he then break through? this difficult pass or obstacle. Iqtahama in Arabic uh, literally means to break through, to hasten into something without thinking about the consequence. So after Allah Azza wa told us that I have showed you the way that leads to salvation, that leads to security, the path of goodness, the path of the truth. What then made you reluctant not to hasten into this in a way that you don't think about anything except going through to rescue yourselves? Aqaba uh, is a difficult uh, path or an obstacle. Uh, now, Allah Azza wa wants us to hasten into going into the path of goodness, the end of which is Jannah, right? But he mentioned that there is an obstacle, there is, there is difficulty whilst doing this. This is just like the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu which is in Bukhari and Muslim, narrated by Anas. It's a long hadith in which the Prophet Sallallahu in a segment of it says, Jannah was surrounded with difficulties, meaning the way leading to Jannah is difficult. For example, waking up in a, on a cold night when you're under the blanket at 3 o'clock in the morning to go and perform wudu with water while you were comfortable and cozy and warm under that blanket and then having to either walk or drive to the masjid to attend the, the uh, congregational prayer and come back is not something comfortable. It's a test. It's something difficult. That's why many people don't do it. They fail the test. Maintaining or observing the fast during long days. I remember the first Summer in Texas, I, I fasted. We broke fast at 9.30 or something. 9.40 at night. 9.40 is close to Qiyam, <laughs> time of Qiyam. 
in other places, you know. <laughs> I'm just joking, but I mean, it's very late. It was, it was very difficult to fast, you know. There are other countries, they break fa fast much later than that. So it's, it's a difficult thing, but what makes it easy is remembering the prize of going through this hardship for the sake of Allah. And by putting it in this way, right, that this is the obstacle, but after which you will reach Jannah, makes it much easier for one to strive very hard to overcome it and go, right? If I tell you, okay, there is this huge rock, if you climb it, just, just take the effort, strive very hard. I know it's difficult, but as soon as you land on the other side, it's eternal bliss. I'll give you a billion dollars, and this many cars, and this many houses, and this many this, and that. You say, oh wow, just by climbing this and landing on the other side, you will try very hard. I would at least. So, how would the case be when the struggle and the striving in return has an eternal bliss in Jannah, which was made and created by Allah Azza wa Jalla. Then Allah Azza wa Jalla goes on to say, وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ مَا الْعَقَبَةِ And what can make you know what is breaking through this difficult pass is? Again, to magnify this matter, this question is emphasizing on this issue. The matter of this obstacle, this difficult pass uh, that Allah Azza wa Jal is talking about to motivate mankind to work hard to overcome it and pass it. Because he's reminding him again and emphasizing that, yes, it's difficult, but the consequence of that is good and your efforts are not going to be going to waste. Then Allah Azza wa Jal gives examples of ways to overcome this difficulty, this obstacle, this hard pass. Fakku raqabah. It is the freeing of a slave. Aw ita'amu fi yawmin di masghaba. Or feeding on a day of severe hunger. Yatiman dha maqraba, an orphan of near relationship, aw miskinan dha matraba, or a needy person in misery. So, the first example Allah Azza wa Jal gave was freeing slaves. And the issue of freeing slaves in Islam is an issue that reflects the greatness of Islam. It's one of the merits of Islam. See, Islam did not come to endorse slavery. Islam, when it came, it came into a society. The practice of slavery was widespread. And what Islam came to do is to put an end for this slavery not to endorse it. That's why if you look through the texts that speak about expiation of many things, free and asleep, free and asleep, free and asleep, free and asleep, free and asleep. Free and asleep. Uh, one of the ha hadith is a hadith by Al-Bukhari and rated by Abu Huraira. This is one of the hadith that encourages the Muslim to free a slave. He said, alayhi salatu wasalam, whoever frees a slave, Allah Azza wa Jal will save every part of his body against a part of the body 
from the slave or of the slave, he freed. In one of the narrations, he started listing his hand for his hand, his leg for his leg, even his private part for his private part. That, all of that would be said. So that was encouraging, that was motivating for the Sahaba to free slaves. So Islam, unlike how it is uh, described uh, by misleading media, Islam did not endorse slavery. Islam came to give a cure to an illness that was widespread, a phenomenon that was widespread. He dealt with it in order to diminish it until it disappears. Now notice this surah is a Meccan surah, right? And uh, in, in the Meccan uh, Quran, uh, no legislations were made. Yet the issue of free and slaves uh, was brought up here uh, as, as one of the exceptions. You know, because it's an expiation for things that one does wrong, right? And uh, subhanallah, uh, among the great, or rather he is the greatest companion, radiallahu anhu, Abu Bakr, uh, was one of those who immediately acted upon overcoming this obstacle and this difficult pass by means of freeing slaves. Uh, he's the one who freed, for example, Bilal. And he used to go to the Quraysh, and whenever he uh, would see them torturing one of the companions, the new believers, who were slaves, he would take them, buy them, and then free them for the sake of Allah. So uh, Abu Quhafa, his father, uh, as uh, Ibn Ishaq uh, reports, came to him one day and he said, son, I've noticed that you're freeing, uh, you're buying very, very weak people. Why don't you buy a strong slave who can be of help and you can use him for some of the tasks? He said, oh father, I am only buying them to free them for the sake of or feeding, or feeding, another example, on a day of severe hunger. A day when food is lacking or prices are high and it becomes difficult for people to buy what sustains them, right? You're a person of wealth. You go look for those poor people who don't have... Uh, food or hardly have any food and go and buy food for them. Masrava, severe hunger. And this is subhanAllah a test for faith. You know because mankind has the tendency of looking after his own well-being before anybody else. So here Allah is encouraging us to be concerned about others, particularly during, during times of hardships, because that's when real faith is manifested. You know, at the time of ease, everybody claims faith. But when does the test come? When things become difficult. You have to give up while you really need it, right? No food available. You're besieged, for example, and there is no food. Alas, food is diminishing to an extent that it's very limited. Oh, my wife this, and my child is that. But when you favor others, that's a real test for your faith, like the story of the Prophet ﷺ, when he is approached by a man and he said, O Prophet of Allah, I'm a hungry person who has no food. Feed me. 
So the Prophet ﷺ got up and went to all his rooms, all his wives, and asked every single one of them, these are the houses of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every one of them answered the same. By the one who has sent you with the truth, we have nothing but water. All the houses of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All of them are out of food. And it's only water. Yes. This is how he led his life sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He didn't care about this dunya. So the Prophet ﷺ went back disturbed, saddened, and looked around and addressed the companions and said, who would host this man? He did his part. He had no food. So immediately one of them jumped and said, I'll take him. And he took him to his house. He got in his house and he spoke to his wife. He said, I have a guest from Muhammad He's not just any guest. He's a guest that was given to me to host by Muhammad by the Messenger of Allah. Meaning be very generous. We're lucky. She said, by Allah, I only have enough food to feed your children today. He said, put them to sleep. Busy them with something until they fall asleep and cook the food and when you bring the food to offer it turn off the candle so the host the the, uh, the guest wouldn't see what we're doing and I would pretend as if I'm eating but I won't touch the food until he eats and satisfied so the plan was implemented as he said the man and the woman didn't know the result of this. The consequence of this simple sacrifice, a meal, but that meal was all they had, right? They fed a person who was hungry during a time of need while they needed it as well. The next day, the Prophet ﷺ said, لَقَدْ عَجِبَ اللَّهُ لَيْصَنِيعَكُمَ الليلة. Allah Azza wa Jal practiced I'jab. I'jab literally means when someone is amazed. Right? And when Allah Azza wa Jal practices this attribute as the scholar said, He forgives the person for his action. Right? This is the implication of this attribute. What did these people do, this man and his wife? They simply gave up dinner. But in essence, this dinner was all they had for them and for their children. What types of people would be needed, uh, needing uh, food? Allah gives a couple of examples. Yatiman da maqraba aw miskinan da maqraba. An orphan of near uh, relationship or kinship or a needy person uh, in misery. An orphan, a person who lost his father or his mother. But his father is stronger. Why? Because he is the source of provision and sustenance, usually, right? But he is not just any orphan. He's an orphan who has a near relationship. He's a kinship. And in that, the reward is doubled. Why? Because first of all, he is giving out charity. Number two, he's maintaining ties of kinship. As the Prophet ﷺ said, when one of the companions asked him how to spend his uh, charity, his money, he wanted to give out some charity, he said, put it, meaning spend it in your, uh, on your kinship, because in this, it's a charity and maintaining ties with kinship. And uh, Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran and through Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam encouraged a lot maintaining and sponsoring and caring for uh, orphans. One of the uh, famous hadith is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, 
I will be this close, and he connected or joined these two fingers, the middle finger and the pointer, uh, with the one in Jannah, with the one who uh, cares for, supports, or sponsors uh, an orphan. Uh, or a needy person uh, in misery, but the word matraba, uh, in Arabic, some of the scholars said it comes from turab. Turab is dust, right? They said he is connected to the soil. This is how poor and miserable he is. You know, when you see someone landing on, on soil, lying on soil, he does not have anything to separate his flesh from it. He has nothing to sit on, nothing or hardly anything to wear. This type of person would be extremely hungry because if he can hardly cover himself, he would certainly not have food to maintain him, his body or his health. ثُمَّ كَانَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ وَتَوَاصَوْا we will conclude with this and uh, give its details inshallah in the following session subhanakallahumma wa hamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk